welcome. Welcome to the European Forum Alpha 2022. It's great to see you all here. What a nice view. I can tell by the look of you that it's going to be great. That's, <laughs> that's this wonderful mixture of um, so many decision makers. You have this first row, you'll hear who's here. So many young people. Sorry that you have to stand, a lot of you, but it's really full. Uh, so many visionaries. So this is going to be a great forum <coughs> with two weeks of discussion on uh, the new Europe. Um, we want your contributions throughout the forum and also in this session, this opening session. So who of you has downloaded the app? Raise your hands. Oh, great. That's nearly all of you. That's great. So you can ask questions via the app. You just have to scan the QR code and you can vote them up. So I will pose one question for every session here from the app, but we, I will also take one, session, uh, one question from the public. And um, apologies to the decision makers, ministers, presidents. I would rather take young people, so please raise your hands if you have to say something. <laughs> I'll, I'll go to you first. My name is Corinne Milban. I'm head of news at Puls 4, Puls 24, Austrian uh, private television network. And I'm looking forward to be your moderator for this session, for the opening. Um, there are also Alpach idea cards. Do you have those? Yes. So if you have an idea, if you want to discuss something during the forum with other participants, please just write it down, and then there's a place where you can put your cards and uh, we can talk about it during the forum. So that's the openings, the organizational stuff, but for the welcome words, please welcome the president of the European Forum Alpach, Andreas Streichel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, well, welcome to all of you, and a, a special welcome to our guest of honor, Mrs. President from Moldavia, Maya Sandu. Heartily welcome. <laughs> a great, a great welcome to our Chancellor who just um, is on a tour from Carinthia to Tyrol, and he stays in Tyrol, and he goes back to Salzburg, and he travels again. We're really happy to, that you made it to Alpbach. Thanks very, very much for coming. Uh, also would like to introduce uh, the house heir here, the bigger house heir, the governor of Tyrol. Thanks very much for coming. Vice President of the European Union Parliament, Otmar Karas, welcome to you. <laughs> welcome to the Bürgermeister, welcome to all ministers and uh, ministerinnen. Thank you very much uh, for coming here. Before we start um, our program, um, there are two seats left today um, because two of our most honored Members of the Alpbach community can't be with us anymore. Both of them um, were incredibly valuable for Alpbach. Both of them didn't miss a meeting for the last 25 years. For both of them, this is the first time that they didn't come in over a quarter of a century. We lost uh, Kaspar Einem, Minister of the Republic of Austria, the soul um, of the Alpbach seminars, the soul of the Alpbach um, art program, and a great friend. And we lost uh, Erhard Busek, Vice Chancellor of the Republic of Austria, President of Alpbach, Honorary President of Alpbach, and in my mind, and I think in many minds of people who sit here, the most European of all Europeans that ever lived. May, may, I ask you, may I ask you for just uh, to stand up for just a little a short minute to think about them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> 
Some people believe that we're, we're trying to do everything new in Altbach. That's, that's, that, that's wrong. The design is new, and, but in reality, what we're doing in Altbach is we're, we're going back to our roots. Um, and I would like to introduce them a little bit to those of you who don't know them. What you have to realize is that the first Forum Altbach, the first time that um, um, resistance fighters, uh, Fritz and Otto Molden, uh, some scientists, some scholars, hmm, got together here in Altbach with a group of young people seven weeks after World War II ended in Europe. While the first Altbach session took place, still two nuclear bombs uh, were thrown on Hiroshima. That was the time uh, when Altbach um, was initiated. It was not easy to get here. Um, the roads and the railways were were vastly destroyed. It was not easy to organize um, because uh, money um, and uh, food were in really short supply. Uh, they didn't find Altbach as the first place to come. The reason why they chose Altbach because uh, the clever inhabitants of Altbach, the farmers, knew that um, they would come from Innsbruck uh, and they would bring cigarettes and other goodies from the Allied forces, and in exchange for that, uh, they gave them quarters and food. And if you think back at that time, I, not in the wildest dreams would anybody have expected at that time that less than half a century later, Europe would have turned into one of the most prosperous regions and one of the best places to live on this planet. It was indeed a remarkable achievement, made possible through the combination of a strong drive for political and economic integration, a hungry and hardworking population, excellence in science and entrepreneurship, the willingness to forgive, the preparedness to help, the drive to create a socially just society, and the growing respect for the benefits of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. The process was gradual in the beginning. The re-establishment of trust between the rogue state of Germany in 1945 and the Allied forces took a long time. In 1955, a few weeks after the 11th Forum, the last soldiers of the Allied forces left Austria and Austria, under pressure from the Soviet Union, declared its everlasting neutrality. For Germany, the occupation was lifted, but the re it remained divided, and it remained uh, um, still with Allied forces being present in Germany. The Allied forces, the English-American in the West, and the Russians um, in the East. What we need to remember at that time is that the integration of Europe would have never been possible without the incredibly consequential manner in which German politics started to eradicate its Nazi history by admitting its guilt, showing remorse, and providing redress. The pacifist politics of Germany rested basically on two pillars. The fear of the Allied forces of a militarily strengthened Germany. And think back that in 1989, 44 years, 44 years after the end of World War II, many European and American politicians regarded German unification as a potential threat to the balance of power in Europe and conveyed concern about a repetition of history. The second pillar was Germany itself, its fear of its own past, of a presumed genetic evil that needed to be contained. So another 33 years have now gone by since 1989, and Germany has transformed itself from a rogue state into one of the strongest democracies and rule-abiding countries on this planet. The world, however, has changed. Autocratic forces are on the rise again. Hopefully, this can be changed in the future. 
But let's be realistic, the world will never be totally democratic. Nonetheless, if we want to secure world peace, let's make sure this, that the combined forces of democracy are about as strong as those of autocracy, and we have that balance, we will continue to do business with autocracies around the world for many, many years to come. Now, let's admit as European one thing, that part of our prosperity is based on our decades-long military underspending, and another part of our prosperity has resulted in our high dependency on Russian energy resources. Let me phrase it differently. For decades, we have trusted Russia to be our main supplier of energy, but we have not trusted Germany in playing an important role in our defense. I'll put it differently, did greed beat trust? I guess the answer to that is simply yes with very few exceptions, like the fact that Germany did not touch the fortunes of some families who came to immense wealth during the Nazi period, it did a remarkable job in eradicating its past. It became the driving force of industrialization in Europe and turned into an almost exemplary democracy. It has done so for 77 years, and it's about time now that we start trusting each other enough to build a European defense system that matches our economic might. But for over 77 years, we have consistently increased our dependency on a country that built an iron curtain, killed citizens who tried to escape it, drove tanks into Budapest and Prague, occupied and destroyed its territories, neglected human rights and rule of law over and over again. So in my view, Europe did not make one mistake. Europe made two mistakes, one on defense and one on energy. And it's absolutely not relevant if a mistake is justifiable due to the situation back then, it was the right thing to do. If you make a mistake, you pay. If you make two mistakes, you pay more. And we are, and we will be paying for it, and with us, other parts of the world, and not only due to the shortage of food supplies in Africa and many other places in the world. Since yesterday, we have 600 carefully selected scholarship holders between the age of 20 and 30 from Europe, including Ukraine, from Russia, from Africa, from Asia, and the Americas, here in Altbach for two weeks to discuss the potentially best solutions for Europe and our planet and to develop proposals and solutions together with great people from science, politics, business, media, and the arts. The first step to solve a problem is to admit that you have a problem and Europe has a problem. In 1945, Europe was at the bottom. 50 years later, Europe was the largest exporter in the world, the largest consumer market in the world. It had global leaders in almost all industries. At the same time, Europe developed the socially most balanced society on this planet. After 1995, around, Europe's economic performance started to deteriorate a little bit, vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis the US, as both countries created giants in the new technology, and Europe has so far failed to do so. The reasons for that are many, and they will be discussed here in Altbach. And that development is not only bad for Europe, but it's bad for the world, as it adds to the risk of bipolarity. I'm very convinced that in the long run, science and technology beat natural resources. Europe is weak on natural resources, therefore we need to be strong on technology. Now, politically, Europe still did a very good job for much, much longer. Um, and in 2022, Europe is still a great place to live. We have to, however, acknowledge that we lost strength and cloud long before the Russian attack on Ukraine. And that attack only just made us suddenly aware and brutally aware of our weaknesses. 
This needs to be changed, and it needs to be changed fast. And sorry, Otmar, speed of action is not Europe's most prominent feature. However, <clears throat> some surprisingly tough decisions have been taken that now need to be followed by equally surprisingly unified and robust actions. Tough action is not the announcement to increase military spending sometime in the future. Tough action needs to be a clear narrative, and it needs to have a clear goal. And one of our four tracks here is the climate opportunity. For that, Europe has a narrative, and it has a clear goal. It's maybe a bit late, but it has climate neutrality for, by 2050. This is maybe the most important goal that we have. Another track here in Altbach is securing our future. For that, Europe, in my opinion, has no clear goal. We actually don't even know exactly what we mean when we say Europe. Just to tell you how I think about it. To me, the UK is Europe before the Brexit and after the Brexit. Ukraine is Europe. Moldova is Europe. Bosnia is Europe. Norway is Europe, and so on. And we need clear rules and definitions for Europe. So I have one. Um, the first one is that within the European Union, we only accept democracy, a commitment to human rights, and the rule of law. That's mandatory. The second, the second is that our goal is that the whole European continent establishes those rules. But we must accept that some states are not yet ready or willing to do so. Therefore, and this is my third point, European institutions will offer economic and institutional support to those countries as much as we can. So we have a chance that they go that way. Fourth, we will not accept any state attacking another state, neither in Europe nor anywhere else in the world. And fifth, we will defend any European state being attacked by another. European borders, European borders are what they are and will never again be changed by force. Europe, <clears throat> Europe has... We have the economic means to do so, and therefore, we need to develop a military force strong enough to implement those policies. Europe's peace dividend has been paid out in full. Now we will reinvest it in securing our future. We appreciate NATO, but we must be able to defend our borders on our own. That's speculation, but... If Europe had been able to give a security guarantee to Ukraine on or before February 23rd, this war would maybe not have happened. We will, we will discuss the Russian attack on Ukraine at length during the next weeks. We don't know how and when this war will end. What we know is that it has already inflicted immense pain and suffering on the people of Ukraine. A European country with no certain future, but a hope for a better one. This hope has for the moment been totally destroyed. It remains to be seen whether we're strong enough and willing to take some pain to help reinstate that hope. In the meantime, many of our citizens are annoyed that Ukrainian SUVs are taking our parking lots and fear that we might have to turn down the temperature to 19 degrees this winter. Some business leaders in Europe complain about the sanctions. They say we have been doing great business with Russia and Ukraine. They say, well, they're both maybe corrupt, but business was great. And European politics is growing it up now. To all of this, People who contemplate these thoughts, please think about the stamina of those Europeans who rebuilt Europe after World War II. We made our mistakes, but Europe and Europeans have so often done such a wonderful job during the past decades. 
And because of that, I'm totally convinced, totally convinced, that the Europeans of 2022 are as strong as the Europeans of 1945. In nearly all of Europe, we do not need to rebuild. All we need to do is to improve. On February 23rd, Ukraine was a country that required a lot of improvement. But on 24th of February, it became a country that needs to be rebuilt. No matter what happens, I would love Europe to play a strong role in giving Ukraine a chance to improve again. I would like to live in a Europe that says, yes, we do have a European Union, thanks God. Some countries are in and some are not. Some countries that are in don't stick to the rules in some countries that are out, do things that we don't like at all. Some rules are mandatory, some rules are very good, and excuse me again, some rules of the EU are pretty useless. But that's not relevant for the moment. What is relevant is that an economically, environmentally, militarily strong, peaceful, innovative, caring, and united Europe of more than 40 nation states would be just a great thing for our planet and the next generation. A Europe in which young people from all over the world have a chance to live, to study, and to work. So let's get it done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, that was a lot of food for thought and a lot of points for discussions for the next two weeks. Don't hold back on discussing all these points. And uh, you can now also start um, putting your questions into the app. I hope you all found it, or also in the, in the public, or upvote questions that you would like to be challenged here. And we will start with a country um, that is wedged right in between the European Union, Russia, the Ukraine, that is on the crossroads of all the conflict that we are seeing now and of the discussions about the future, and we're really thrilled that the president of Moldova could make it here. She just had the Secretary General of the UN for dinner, I think before yesterday, so that's um, how big the crisis is, and thank you so much for making time to come here and share your thoughts. Please welcome the president of Moldova, Maya Sandu. Please. Thank you. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, Mr. Governor, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's my, even if it's my first time in Alpbach, I uh, did hear that it's one of the most inspirational places uh, to be here, to exchange ideas, thoughts, and find common solutions to the challenges we're facing as a continent and as a world. I was supposed to have a conversation in this session with President van der Bellen for you today, but unfortunately, you'll have to listen only to me in this part of the discussion. I very much hope President van der Bellen will recover soon and maybe will even be able to join you um, at a later time during your stay in Albach. I wish him good health and speedy recovery. In today's... In two days from now, this Wednesday, Ukraine will celebrate in the middle of unprecedented challenges to its sovereignty and territorial integrity, the 31st anniversary of its Independence Day. It's a day that any state should mark in peace by celebrating its people, its past achievements, its traditions, and sharing ideas for a bright future. Instead, Ukraine today is at war. For six months, it fights an unjust war for its right to exist as a state 
within its internationally recognized borders. It is, also, it is also shielding our own territorial integrity, our own independence as a country. It's fighting to keep all of us safe, to keep Europe safe. It needs our back and support. Europe, all of us, we must help Ukraine. I would like to express I would like to express my utmost admiration to all Ukrainians for their courage, their resilience, their inner power to continue this fight for survival, justice, and freedom. We owe ourselves a strong and resilient Europe, a Europe that will be able to stand by all its citizens, by the values and principles that Europeans cherish and that the Ukrainians chose to fight for. They also want to be part of the free world, where everyone has the freedom to choose who to be and what kind of future to have for their children. How do we build a strong and resilient Europe is a question that all try to, we all try to answer now from our perspective positions, be it at the university, in an NGO, in a foundation, public institution, or from the private sector. One thing that is crystal clear is that only together we can build a Europe that is strong and resilient enough to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. There is no simple answer on how to build a strong and resilient Europe, but I would like to suggest a few things for discussions. For discussion. Counter disinformation, strengthen energy security and transition faster to uh, green energy, fight together against corruption and extend further the peace project of the European Union. Number one, one of the biggest threats to democracy in Europe today is disinformation. We need to do much more to fight propaganda than we did in the last decade. For too long, the EU has treated this subject superficially and the instruments used were ineffective. We have seen the effects of propaganda and disinformation in the case of several elections in European countries. In Moldova, we became a testing ground for new disinformation tools. We feel its consequences the hard way. Today, we witness a full-fledged campaign to justify the war in Ukraine through propaganda and disinformation. And unfortunately, there are many people who fall into this trap, regardless of the country they live in or the lang language that they speak. It is true that there is a thin line between freedom of expression and stopping disinformation, but propaganda and disinformation are some of the biggest dangers to democracy and need to be addressed accordingly. We need new international norms on social media as unpopular as this might sound. For instance, several social media outlets never react to the requests of the Moldovan institutions to suspend pages that distribute or promote fake news about the war, about COVID or hate speech. If we could develop some common mechanisms and enforce them together as an international community, the owners of these social media outlets could not longer ignore the problem so easily, and we could protect our democracy from falling prey to false narratives. Second, to become more resilient, Europe needs to ensure its energy security and transition faster to green energy. This crisis has proven that Europe has not invested sufficiently and at the right time in its own energy security. It needs to reduce fragmentation of the market, diversify more uh, its energy supply and faster transition to green energy. Greater energy integration and accelerated investment will enable Europe to defeat uh, Russia's strategy or anyone else attempts in the future to weaken Europe by weaponizing energy. 
It will also drive the transition to cleaner and more affordable energy. Moldova is not the country to teach Europe how to do this. Unfortunately, in the last three decades, little has been done in my country to secure energy independence. The energy crisis that we find ourselves trapped in risks being misused to destabilize the political situation in my country. Everyone in Europe face, faces a grim winter, but political instability in Moldova as a result of unaffordably, unaffordable day living will, um, will be disastrous not only for us, but also for the West and Ukraine. Since its first days in office, the current Moldovan government is working hard to strengthen the country's energy security and diversify our energy mix. Most recently, Moldova has been included in the joint energy purchases under the Repower EU plan, which aims to strengthen the uh, continent's energy security. We look forward to see this mechanism being put at use. Three, Europe needs to put the fight against corruption seriously on its agenda. This time as a collective fight because corruption proved to have no borders. Moldova has had a traumatic experience when corrupt groups came to power. They significantly weakened state institutions. Democracy was discredited because they were speaking as democratic governments and our European dream along with it. Some people came to believe that democracy is to be blamed for corruption and poverty. Importantly, the biggest robberies in my country happened with the participation of some Western companies or banks. The money laundering schemes, the famous or infamous $1 billion bank theft, this happened even with the involvement of some banks from the EU or offshore companies from countries with consolidated democracies and with strong anti-corruption institutions. Moldova lost lot, a lot of money that otherwise should have been invested in energy security, hospitals, schools, roads, universities for the people. Now we are struggling to recover both stolen assets, but more importantly, the time that we have lost during the last decades. And this is a very difficult process. That is why we need clear international cooperation mechanisms so that dirty money from fragile democracies is not, no longer accepted in other countries and in cases where things have already happened to be able to recover the stolen money and to bring the thieves to justice. It is not okay when people who steal and destroy democratic institutions in our countries take their capital and live beautifully in countries with consolidated democracies, enjoying respect for human rights and high quality public services. We need to improve international instruments for mutual legal assistance to make asset recovery and restitution faster and more efficient. We can create joint investigation teams, mutual legal assistance mechanisms, or create measures for direct recovery of property via civil procedures. We can create an international legal platform for exchange of information for integrity authorities. We should all enforce stricter rules on political party financing. We need to join our collective efforts to create new international rules and guidelines that would prevent corrupt people from leaving the country and taking the illegally acquired assets with them. And number four, the EU must offer a clear and credible accession perspective for candidate countries that have the strong political determination to join the European family of nations and the will to implement the necessary reforms. Enlargement can foster peace and stability in Europe and bring prosperity to all. Moldova and Ukraine want to be part of the EU. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Austria and all the EU member states for their vote of confidence in a June European Council meeting when Moldova and Ukraine were granted EU candidate status. Moldova is a European country with a European history, European language, European culture, European political system. We share the ideal of 
a peaceful, united and prosperous Europe. Through accession, the EU has anchored the democracies of Greece, Spain and Portugal as they were emerging from dictatorship. And by offering a European perspective to the Balkans, it has stabilized the region after the Yugoslav wars. It now must do it again through enlargement into our volatile region. And finally, if Europe is to take a more active role in the world stage, we must remember and find solace in our values. We need to remind ourselves why do we do what we do, why we take our stances and promote our policies. I say we because I believe that a vast majority of Moldovans share the same beliefs. We share a set of values that put the individual, the person, its life and well-being at the center of every decision, of every project and policy. The future we are building together emphasizes the value and the potential of every single person. It's a society that values reason, science, work, but also diversity and compassion. And as experience shows, giving people freedom and the chance to pursue happiness is also a sound economic thinking. European countries created what is perhaps the most humane and prosperous model available to humans today. To conclude, a more resilient Europe needs more resilient people, societies, institutions and states. We all need to lead by example. That's what we're trying to do today in Moldova. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for these excellent points. These are points that will be discussed during the forum, and I think you will be cited in a lot of the session that will happen during the next two weeks. Um, thank you also for dedicating your whole speech to Europe and how it can be better, especially for tackling disinformation in your speech. That's something that's really not tackled enough in Europe. Um, we have a lot of questions for you, but I'd like first to ask you some questions about your situation in your country, because it's, it's a dire one. Um, the first, perhaps, on the security right now. So how do you see um, the threats that are coming um, from right over your border? Of course, we are concerned and the, the risks are high as long as, uh, as the, war is, uh, the war continues and, and since the uh, Russian troops uh, started the war against Ukraine, uh, everybody is, uh, is in danger. Nobody can feel safe. Moldova is a very fragile country, a fragile democracy. Um, Moldova doesn't have a strong defense system. Mm -hmm. and we were not preparing for war as no one was preparing for war in Europe. Uh, Moldova still has um, weak institutions. We are only trying to build a strong state. And uh, as I mentioned in my uh, speech, uh, today Ukraine is defending Moldova, as Ukraine is defending the rest of the Europe. So we are uh, trying to monitor the situation, uh, especially because we have the Russian troops in Transnistria, the breakaway region. Uh, we do uh, see the risks. We are trying to prepare for these risks, but there is that much that a country like Moldova can do. That's why we submitted the application together with Ukraine, the application for the EU membership, even though, of course, we have been planning to submit this application for a very long time. But we decided to submit it in such a dramatic moment uh, because we believe that EU is also a peace project, not just uh, a project of democracy, uh, prosperity, but it's also a peace project. And uh, it was very important to get the positive decision of the European Council, and we're very grateful for that. Um, could someone of the organizers hand me my phone that's there in the first, because I can't see the question on the tablet just um, in the course of the next <laughs> question. Um, 
I would also like to ask you how you are you dealing with the refugee situation because Moldova is not a rich country, so you have social issues anyways. You said you're in for a dire winter. Um, do you have enough aid from Europe? I am very grateful to the Moldovan citizens for their generosity. In the first um, months of the war, uh, half a million Ukrainian refugees entered Moldova for a population of 2.6 million. Uh, this is quite an important number. Today, the number of refugees uh, which stay in Moldova is about 3%. Um, it has been pretty difficult at the beginning because we had to deal with a situation that we had no experience and, and it was overwhelming. But again, we were uh, very lucky to have citizens who came to help uh, the government institutions. And actually, most of the refugees today stay uh, with citizens. So citizens are providing uh, them with houses. And that's um, really incredible. The response of the population in Moldova was incredible and still is. So, uh, as of now, uh, the situation is much easier. Of course, we have to prepare for the school year, so we have to uh, do a better job in terms of uh, providing or creating the conditions for all the children, because half of the more than half of the uh, refugees, Ukrainian refugees in Moldova, are children. So uh, now the challenge is to to provide them with uh, conditions for schooling, the healthcare. We do receive uh, support from the international community, from the UN organizations, UNHCR, UNICEF, and so on. And we have been benefiting from bilateral uh, support uh, from many of our friends. And, and of course, EU has been helping uh, through this process. Um, I would like to ask you what you expect from Europe in the future, but I think um, it's better if you discuss this with a European head of state, and luckily we have one in the audience. <laughs> um, please welcome the Chancellor, the Federal Chancellor of the Republic of Austria, Karl Nehammer. Thank you so much for being here. So, Mr. Chancellor, thank, thank you so much for taking time before your actual statement that will follow after the session to have a, um, a discussion with the President of Moldova. Um, she was really clear on what Europe needs to do. Could I have a reaction from your side to the points that the President made? Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, Moldova and Madam President is doing a great job. Um, Austria supports Moldova. Yeah. Austria and Moldova have um, strong cooperation, a strong cooperation. We need each other because um, it's necessary now to help Moldova. You mentioned it already. A lot of refugees are there. The economic situation is really hard. And um, we try to bring voluntarily refugees from Moldova to Austria. And we try to help directly in Moldova. And I think Madam President mentioned a very important point for the future for all of us. It is um, the kind of question of propaganda, <laughs> the question of um, disinformation from the Russian side. And please um, look now into the EU member states and the discussion there. Now we are talking about, um, or some of us are talking about, if we should keep the sanctions against the Russian Federation. And I think this is a very important question, and there is a clear answer. We have to do that. We have to keep the sanctions. <laughs> you know, we have to face that there is a country who is doing an invasion against an independent state, and this is not acceptable. And doing sanctions against the Russian Federation is the most peaceful way to show the protest against this. In former times, we did war in Europe. So we have to keep the sanction. And yes, it's right to think about and to ever evaluate if the sanctions work. Because there's one really important fact, the sanctions have to hurt the Russian Federation more than us. Because we have to keep the sanctions and we have to stabilize our economic situation in the European Union and in Europe. You mentioned Europe is much more bigger than the European Union. And um, so we have always to think about, is this the 
right method, but it's for me no kind of discussion that we need the sanctions against the Russian Federation. And we need, all of us um, in the European Union, we need um, uh, the discussion how we can improve our help all the time for Ukraine, but also for Moldova, for example. <laughs> and the Russians try to increase all the time the pressure against your government. And um, so, yes, I can only ask you to stay strong and Austria will be on your side. Thank you. Thank you. There's an interesting question. It's the most upvoted in the app right now. It's from uh, Jeldrik Schottke. Um, and he asks, and I'd, li I'd like to direct that to you both, actually. Should we talk and exchange more or less with Putin? Meaning, I um, suppose, is it necessary to keep up talks? What do you say from your perspective? I believe you should ask those who have tried uh, this in the past. And in we'll do that in a minute. <laughs> um, well, we can, we can only judge from experience. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, from what we see, from what we hear from Kremlin, they have different plans. Uh, they seem to be in a different world. Um, what we need to do is to, to stop this war and to do everything that can stop this war. Um, I don't know who would be able to make a change by talking, because so far we haven't been seeing any results uh, in order to prevent or to stop this war by talking, by negotiations. Mr. Chancellor, you did try. You talked to Putin. Um, what is your perspective now, I think nearly half a year after? Um, I think it will be no surprise, my answer, no. I think we should try it again and again, and I can argue why. When um, first I met Putin, afterwards I phoned him. And uh, we talked about the situation in uh, Ukraine and the need for green corridors out. You mentioned it, President uh, of the Forum mentioned that the corn is necessary for the world. So also President Erdogan tried it and also the Secretary of the United Nations tried it. Um, and now we see it worked. So I think it's necessary to talk it's necessary not to be naive. Um, there will not be a fast end of this war. We have to face it also. But I think it's necessary to talk for sure to Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is the victim. And we also have to talk to the Russian Federation. And um, I am very thankful. Also, I mentioned the Secretary General of the United Nations, also to the President of the International Red Cross, you know, the war prisoners exchange is um, very important for the families of the prisoners. I'm a soldier as well, and I try my best to support the International Red Cross in their work, and they do a great job because it works and it still works. It's not easy to do that. And yes, my answer is clear. We have to talk. We have to clear in our positions. We have to think how we can make Russian clear, not only Russia. We, we only talk about the Russian Federation. We in the Western world have to face and to accept that not the whole world has the same opinion we have. Mm -hmm. India, China, Africa, the African Union, uh, South America. So we have to try to convince them. We have to try to convince India to stop the cooperation with the Russian Federation. We have to increase the pressure against the Russian Federation to show that war is never, ever a method in a new world, in a new Europe, we talk now in this forum. And so I think it's necessary to work together, not to stop talks, but not to be naive. Thank you very much. I'll take one question from the audience here. So could you raise your hands if you have a question? You can do this. Yes, here. <laughs> you will get a microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from Ukraine. And as Kansovar mentioned, I have one question about Red Cross. Uh, if you remember recently, Red Cross, well, not recently, a few months ago, visited Russia, and it was discussion about opening camp for refugees from Ukraine. You said that you support the Red Cross actions. 
Yeah, I want to ask your justification of yeah, what you mentioned. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I'll pass that directly to you. So the question was that um, the Red Cross wanted to open a camp for refugees in Russia. Did I get that right? And if you support this as you support the Red Cross? Yeah, um, um, I would do that if I'm asked to do that because, you know, the International Red Cross is not on the stage of political discussions. They do it behind the scenes and they are very success, so successful, successful in doing that. So, um, but if the president asks me to do that, I, I will do that. And um, um, now it's a long time ago I talked to Putin, but um, if there is a new chance, I would mention it that it is necessary to have these refugee camps. Thank you. I'd like to give the last word in this session to you, Mrs. President. Um, what is it that you need from Europe? You made excellent point on what Europe has to do in the whole. What is it that you from Moldova need? Because we need to discuss that too. Well, uh, long term, we would like Europe to help us stay part of the free world. This is what this is all about. Short term, we need help to survive this winter. Um, inflation is already above 30% in Moldova, and this is mainly because of the huge increase in the energy prices. We're paying today, I mean, the, the price is 10 times higher than what we were paying for gas last year. You can imagine what's the impact of peop on people, and especially in a poor country where the, uh, the share of expenses on food and on energy uh, accounts is so big in people's uh, budget. So uh, now we have an issue because we haven't been able, of course, to secure the energy security in a year since the government has changed. We need help to survive this winter and not to allow for the destabilization to happen just because we cannot provide people with electricity or gas or because the price is just so, so high that it's totally unaffordable to us. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. President, for the excellent points. We will discuss them throughout the forum. And thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And yes. And I would now like to ask the Federal Chancellor of the Republic of Austria, Karl Nehammer, for his actual statement, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, um, you asked me a question to do my stand statement. Um, what do you think the new Europe will look like, was the question. Well, first, again, many thanks for the invitation. Glad to be here at the European Forum of Alpach. This year's theme was rightly chosen. It was the 24th of February. We have indeed entered a new phase. We are already living in a new Europe. It's unbelievable, unbelievable, but it's true. War is back on European soil. A European country is fighting for its freedom. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine also poses a high risk of destabilizing the Western Balkans region. This would bring the war from the Union's eastern borders directly to its center. For example, we see also in Bosnia the domestic political situation is very volatile. In concern to the elections in October, there's also a tense situation between Serbia and Kosovo. And I appreciate that last week a meeting in Brussels with President Vucic and Prime Minister Kurti was held. So that is what I meant before. It's always necessary to talk. We must work closely together to prevent that this war doesn't come to the center of the EU. We have to think about the Republika Srpska, the influence of the Russian Federation to the Republika Srpska. I've heard that President Todik will meet Putin now in the next weeks. 
We don't have to forget that the EU and the Western Balkans were already before the war in Ukraine partners of high strategic importance to each other, especially for Austria. This is even more the case after the Russian aggression against Ukraine than before, and I'm not getting tired to mention the importance that the EU talks more often with rather than about the Western Balkans. And that's the reason why it was so important to me to set the focus also on Bosnia-Herzegovina at the last European Council and to discuss about the possibility for a candidate status. We decided the candidate status for Ukraine because we think that it's an important signal for the future of Ukraine to give Ukrainian people hope, to show them that they are a part of Europe, of the European family. And so that's the reason why I think all countries of the Western Balkans as well deserve a credible EU perspective and Austria will remain firmly committed to it. There must be no first and second class applicants or double standards. As I mentioned it before, we are already living in a new Europe since the 24th of Europe. And this new Europe has to recognize that it's now more important than ever to work and talk together, especially with the Western Western Balkans. Because we have, as Austrians and also the European Union, a special responsibility for this region. Our security and stability is directly linked to the Western Balkans. Before I became Chancellor of the Federal Republic, I was the Minister of Interior. I can give you a proof how important it is to cooperate, to share intelligence information, to protect the people in Austria, in Europe, in, Bos in Bosnia, Herzegovina, in North Macedonia, Montenegro, the whole Western Balkans. And, especially Austria, has strong economic relations with securest tens of thousand jobs in Austria and in the Western Balkans. So that's the reason why I, as a Chancellor of the Republic, Austria as a member state of the EU, say all the time, the EU is not complete without the Western Balkans. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have one follow-up question, Mr. Chancellor, on this, which is being asked also in the audience. Um, it's clear that seeing the strong influence of Russia and also China in the Balkans it is vital for Europe to connect and to grant accession status, that's clear. But uh, how will the EU deal with countries that have a very different opinion on the conflict right now, that are very much on the side of Russia, like Serbia, for example? What will this change in the balance in Europe if um, this accession, accession process goes on? I think you mean Serbia, for example. I mean Serbia, of course, yes. Well. Let us look to the foreign policy of Serbia. Serbia didn't vote against the sanctions in the United Nations of the European Union. Serbia is a very important player in between the Western Balkan states. So I think it's necessary, again, not to be naive, to be clear to show a way how we can cooperate. Also, 
where to have, where Serbia has to improve the rule of law and other standards of the European Union, but not to talk with Serbia, not to cooperate. I think it's not the right way, um, first of all, to bring them to us. I mentioned Russia and the influence of Russia in the Western Balkans, but it's not only Russia, it's the Republic of China. It's really, a, um, you see now a lot of projects there done by China. You see the United Arab Emirates there. So, but there, the Western Balkans are in between, in real, in the Europe map. And I think we should try everything to, to bring them in, to cooperate, to try our best. And we have to focus now really to Bosnia-Herzegovina. There is a dangerous situation. There are the elections in November. We have a problem between the minorities of Bosniaks and Croats. And we have to help them. We have to focus them. They have to see that we are interested what is going on there. And so that's the reason why I think it's also necessary to talk to all partners of the Western Balkans. Thank you very much. There's a lot of questions about climate change and the balance between security and climate, also here in the forum and on this podium, and luckily we, that's our next point. So um, We have the CEO of uh, Plan A with us. She's one of the most influential founders in the European green tech landscape. And um, I would ask you for your statement. Please welcome Dubomila Jordanova. <laughs> welcome, please. <laughs> And we will then go into the discussion with the Chancellor. Please, Lovamila. Dear Madam President, uh, dear Vice President, uh, dear President Chancellor, and honorary guests, today I'm incredibly honored to be able to speak in front of you because for all these important topics that have been discussed until now, we also have to highlight what is ahead of us and what is already with us, which is the climate change crisis. We're in a crisis of leadership underpinned by the events from the last months which have highlighted many mistakes that we've made in the past. And this leadership paralysis is understandable. Never in human history have we seen so many worlds unfold. A war, an energy crisis, cost of living crisis, a climate change reality which is happening now across Europe, and of course an exhausted post-COVID society. We need leadership that will define the future for these crucial next few years that will be the ones defining also the crucial next decades. In a world looking very unfamiliar, this role should be played by Europe. And the key responsibility that we need to take is focusing on climate change as the topic that we will lead the world through. Climate change is a global issue that needs local response. An approach we live by in Europe, and in particular in the European Union. The negative repercussions of climate change have been distributed across all industries. They've destroyed our supply chains, they've demonstrated how weak our economies are, given how connected they are. That doesn't mean we need to become less globalized, but that means that we need to make sure that we embed stability in all of these connections that we have with the rest of the world. We have the frameworks and the knowledge. Europe has been allowing itself to lead the climate change discussion, be it through the Green Deal, be it through the green tech innovation, evolution that I have the honor to be part of. And most importantly, thanks to our history of endurance, commitment, and also collaboration. And all of us here coming from business, policy, science, private sector and the public sector need to play a part in driving this agenda. This is not going to be solved by one single actor. It won't be the governments, it won't be only business, it will be every single one of us taking our own responsibility within the realm of work that we already have. No one needs to become a scientist in order to act on climate change. We all have a part to contribute to a more sustainable and stable economy. We need to take multiple steps in order to position Europe to be in this leadership for the whole world. The first one is to have better and more aligned KPI systems. At the moment, we rely on an accounting system that is not connected to reality. And climate change is actually financial uh, 
burden on all of us. Climate risk is financial risk. And if we don't embed the correct KPIs, if we don't start talking the exact language that everyone aligns to, we're never going to be able to enable all these small businesses, but also large conglomerates, to be pushing for the same united vision for a sustainable Europe and therefore a sustainable world. The second is that we need to go beyond disclosures. We have been talking about these different frameworks. We have a fantastic set of KPIs in, in mind when it comes to the EU taxonomy. But we need to focus on decarbonization. Our economy is heavily reliant on creating its value through also creating emissions. That doesn't need to stay like that. There's enough innovation out there to enable for this transition to be just, to be innovative, to be driven by technology, and to be one that enables every single one of us to be a participant. And finally, something that I've seen throughout my work in the last six years is the role of education. You have no idea how many times I've been in a situation speaking to people of all walks of life where the basic concepts around climate change are missing, which allows for the discussion to be politicized, it allows for the discussion to be ineffective, for resources to be wasted, and ultimately for this big agenda that the whole of Europe has to not be able to align other stakeholders that are elsewhere in the world, but also within our own countries. By implementing such initiatives, I don't have doubt Europe can lead the world into a more sustainable future. But I'm not sure we've decided to do so yet. We show again and again lack of willingness to commit to addressing climate change, often fusing many discussions into one, diminishing the scale of the threat ahead of us. There is no business on a failing planet. There is no economies on a failing planet. There is no political differences on a failing planet. It is our responsibility to choose and lead into a future which we will define together for the world. Let's give Europe the chance to reclaim its leadership position in defining a just and sustainable future for the whole world. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll pass that right on to the Chancellor. I think nobody would say that climate um, policies are not important. Everybody says it's, it's the most important thing to do in various aspects. But still, um, it, it's difficult to see it on the ground. Where are the solar plants? Where are the windmills? Where are the power lines? Where are the, um, <laughs> where are the states? that say, yes, we're going to build this here, even in Austria. So, <laughs> so I think everybody's with you on the words, but how's the action going to come? Well, now directly to the scholarship students, well, warmly welcome to Austria. You can see a nation who, who is doing its best to reach these goals. We have to think, or we have um, to well, I can mention it now that um, we produce, for example, in months like July, August, or June, all our electricity from renewable energy. That's a fact. So if it goes through the year, 75% of our electricity is produced by renewable energy. Now we try to reach the goal for the final 25%. It's not easy, you know, it's the discussion in Austria um, as well uh, because of their um, high dependence on Russian gas, where we need this gas. We need it in the industry and we need it for the gas power plants because we need the gas power plants in the months of January or December or February. There we need the gas production for electricity. So um, it's not easy to reach this goal, but we will do it. We try our best. Um, and I think if you go with open eyes through Austria, if you see the village of Alpbach, if you ask, how do you heat the houses there? What are you doing for the environment? You will get the right answers. But now we need the same models for the big cities like Vienna, Linz, Graz, and others. And um, I think we are in a good way, but we have, I think, to realize that now the circumstances are really tough. We have a high inflation rate, so the people suffer. We have high energy costs, so the people suffer. And not only the people, also the economics, industry, 
also agriculture business. So we have to think about now, first, as a chancellor, I have to think about as my government, how we can support the people. And afterwards, closely, we think about how we can stop the dependence to the fossil energy, but especially now to the Russian gas. So I think it's, um, it's a way. All crises bring also chances. I think we have to think about the chances, and it's um, now in these times more necessary than before to think about also the chances, because we read a lot about the crisis. We read only less about the chances which crises bring. And um, so, yeah, I think we have to work together. We have to share information. We have to think about where we can improve our efforts, and then we will solve this question. So, you see, governments want to do this. I think that's clear now, and Europe has a strategy. What can they do from your perspective to speed up things? Is there something that you can share with decision makers? Definitely, and I think all these statistics are incredibly important because they set the scene for many to consider that the task is not as burdensome when the economy, uh, like the one of Austria, has already taken these steps. I think where we sometimes miss the point is when we think about the global scale of climate change, um, the truth is, is that the main emissions that get to be addressed are somewhere else, but they come also from the production of the companies that come from the European economy. So collaborating with the stakeholders that are in these other countries, but also starting to embed the thinking about decarbonization in the way even contracts for businesses are done, in the way certain projects that maybe the government's uh, fund are done, can allow for a lot more effective action. I've seen extensively in all the work that we've been doing uh, with thousands of businesses that the main issue that they face is lack of collaboration amongst the value chain. And I think governments have a big part to play because they can unify the reporting standards, they can imp impose or suggest decarbonization as the main action that is taken, not only creating a report, but going beyond that. And finally, it's also about, again, and I don't want to repeat myself, but it is important to understand this, education across the border. It's about citizens being educated, it's about businesses, it's about uh, stakeholders within businesses, also anyone that is on the periphery. Um, and this is the only way we, we stand a chance. If it, this is on a national level or only on a one business level, the results wouldn't be fast enough. There's a question that is most important of all the... Um, of all the energy and climate questions here, and, and I think it's a question that's shared by many. It's by Gregor Braun, somewhere here. Um, how can it be possible that oil companies are making the highest profits in the century during an energy crisis, and what's Europe's position on this? Oh, it's an easy question. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, now we see the risk, and... Um, we feel the risk of this um, still high dependence on uh, fossil energy. And um, we are talking about the private sector. So they now are doing <laughs> good business for their perspective. And um, well, we have to think together, together I think it's necessary to, to focus it, that this is, we have to do it now to think together how we can solve this crisis because um, on the one hand, we see that now I visited now a really huge industry complex in Austria, and, and the owner of this industry now tries the, the best to reduce the dependence on gas. But the real important question is, in, in, in this case, we, it's not necessary to, to raise any pressure because the pressure is huge now because the energy costs are so high. So now what we have to do as a government is to help this business um, um, to come over this crisis. That's the first point. The second point is, well, for sure we have to think about how we can finance all this support now for the people, for the industry, for the economic, for the agriculture system. And... Um, I don't think that always new taxes are the answer, but um, uh, solidarity, yes. And uh, now it's the question for the politics, how to solve this gap between solidarity and uh, the necessity to, to help the people with real money to come over this crisis. Thank you very much. Do you want to react shortly? 
I just want to say that we need to think that every single job of the future is going to be a climate job. If the industries that don't respond now and they don't move into the new, more renewable version of themselves, uh, they would have to face the very negative repercussions that come from what climate change will bring to them. And those that are adapting now are also going to, going to reap off the effects by making more profit and therefore creating more jobs. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to think about this also in the context of um, these industries that you mentioned. Thank you. I'll take a question from the room here. Uh, before doing that, there's a lot of you who asked about the climate protection laws. Could you uh, raise your hands, those who are interested in the answer to that? So I want to see. Yeah, that's it. Um, I, I do that directly, OK, because it's a lot in your app. Um, that's a question that why, directed to you, why are you blocking climate protection law in Austria, meaning that young people have the right to go to court and um, fight against climate crimes or for the future. I think we have um, to solve this question not only in the solution that someone has the right to go to court. I think um, we have to try to do everything now to, to realize that this crisis now is also a chance. Mm -hmm. But it's not a chance in one year or in the next five years, maybe ten years it's, uh, are needed to, to reach the goal to be independent from fossil energy. It maybe it never ends totally, but uh, we reduce it uh, significantly. But um, I think we don't block it because of that. We, 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 are, we are don't blocking each other in the government we are doing negotiations, we are a democracy, so we have sometimes different point of views, so we have negotiations and afterwards we will find a solution and afterwards we decide. I think this is democracy, please. Um, um, I think give us some time for that. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. i take another question here from the young woman there, but uh, behind you. <laughs> But not on the same topic, please. But I'm sure you have other questions too, please. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Agne from Lithuania, but I work in Brussels in exactly the field of decarbonization. And I would like to ask um, your opinion. How important is um, a collaboration between public authorities and business? And what are the best ways to foster the facilitate, uh, to facilitate uh, this engagement and collaboration and partnership between business world and uh, public authorities to... Um, Work, while well, working um, towards um, decarbonization. Thank you very much. I'll hand that to you first, because you're from the business world. So. <laughs> I think this is our only chance of actually being able to address climate change is by enabling for feedback loops to be created between public and private sector. At the moment, there's a lot of legislation that comes out that has never been uh, actually feedback from business and also actions for net zero being taken uh, which maybe do not support the sustainability and net zero agenda of a government. And the only way we can go ahead is when resources are distributed effectively, which at the moment is still not the case. Businesses take a lot of actions, then they end up facing a lot of issues on a legislative level and vice versa. Uh, I think the EU has a big part to play. Governments, but also businesses, need to make up for anything that at the moment is maybe slower on the government side. Thank you very much. Sorry for not taking more questions and sorry also for discriminating against the men in the public and taking the women. I know it's hard. We know the feeling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for once, you'll have to deal with it. Thank you. Um, I'll give the last word on this panel to you, Mr. Chancellor. Um, thank you. Because I heard, I've heard in the audience, we don't have time, huh? Guys, where are you? Yeah. You told me. We don't have time anymore, you told me. So thank you very much for that. But I can only um, invite you to show what we really did in Austria. 75% renewable energy in production of electricity is huge. So we are a good example for the European Union and the world. We try to export our knowledge because um, we think climate protection is the question of our future. So I think cooperation, because this was the question, I think the cooperation between public and private economy is very important. I think it's 
um, the best way to solve this problem. Because if we talk to the industry, for example, now, they try their best, really, to get out of the dependence. So now we have to support them. We have to think about new ways. We have to think about new laws. For example, to storage CO2. We have to think about that. And we have to support them because economy and industry is so important. We need that. We are a social welfare state in Austria. We need economy, we need industry, and uh, we need jobs. Because that's the reason why we can, or that's the reason why we can help now this high level of social standard in Austria. So I think it's always a question of cooperation, working together. And there, I think we have to have open hands for this kind of cooperation between private sector and the public sector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. That was a really fruitful discussion. Thanks for being here. Thank you. So let's move on to the topic of democracy and rule of law. And who better to talk about this than the first vice president of the European Parliament, who has been very vocal also on autocratic systems within Europe and on the sanction. Please welcome Otmar Karas. Excellences, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear Andreas Dreichel and your team, thank you very much firstly to your speech. That was a very good introduction. We have a lot to do. It is not the time to defend the past, uh, to argue the status quo. We have to go forward. We need leadership. And first, thank you for the invitation. On behalf of the European Parliament and its President Roberta Metzola, I am very appreciate that the European Forum Alpach creates a space to discuss our common future, the future of the European Union. Our future and the future of the European Union are connected. We are sitting in the same boat. This year's motto, a new Europe, could not be more timely. We read and hear a lot about turning points and transformation. But many are not aware that this means that there can and will be no carrying on as before. So what is our current situation? The massive inflation and price increases are hitting us all, though with different intensity, and are likely to push social tensions further. The war in Ukraine must lead to a new debate on the EU's defense policy, a new debate about the EU's foreign affairs policy, a new debate about a common energy policy, and so on. Everything what we are discussing today is connected. That is not only one chapter and one solution without the others. The expansion of renewable energy is essential to reduce our energy dependence on the long term. And it's not only a question of renewable energy, it's also a question of research policy, of economic policy, of taxation policy, of education policy, of our way of life, of our political will to change anything. And we are facing the challenge of our lifetime. Because our European democracy, our way of life, is under threat. The war in Ukraine marks a systemic conflict also. Democracy versus 
Autocracy. Diplomacy versus Brutality. Some tendencies we sadly see not only outside, but also inside the European Union. For example, the various violations of the rule of law. So we must finally learn what a precious good our European democracy is. We have to learn what a precious good our values, our charter of fundamental rights are. What is most important now is to look forward together and to make an honest effort to overcome this multiple crisis as effective as possible. For me, this includes an honest analysis and brave solutions. And I believe this is exactly what the new European Forum Alpbach is for. You are one of the centers of the think tanks to go forward, not to stop, not to criticize, to find new solutions, to go new ways. In fact, what needs to be done is on the table. The Conference on the Future of Europe put forward very concrete proposals for our new Europe. I was skeptical at the beginning and the pandemic added to that. But the enormous passion of many citizens led to a gigantic democratic political project. It is crucial in terms of democratic policy making that these proposals are now fully implemented and put into practice. For that we have no time. We have to go forward. We have to start the implementation for all concrete projects are on the table. The European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, will be a transparent advocate of the proposals and fight for a European Convention. That is not the only one solution. But the current and the recent crisis show very clearly only if we update our common framework and the EU treaties, also for a defense policy, we will be able to make the European Union more democratic, more able to act, more competitive, more green, more social and more digital. It often sounds simple, but it is what we should take to heart every day. Only together, united and resolute, we will master the many crises of our time. And I am sure that we will master them. Yes, we can. Because every crisis has yet strengthened the European Union, not weakened it. Our future, the new Europe, is in our hand. We are, everybody of us, especially the politicians, are responsible. But it will not happen by itself. It needs courage, honesty, responsibility in Austria and throughout Europe, I can only ask what more has to happen for the responsible and democratic center in Europe to finally wake up and come back to work together and to go forward. The duty of politics is not to ignore complexities, but to take over responsibility and to solve them together.
thank you so much. Very important words and very credible from your side. But still, there's one person you do not mention when you talk about the need to work together and to have a new framework. And you've been one of his critics. Viktor Orban will never have the same stance as you on this. But still, you need his vote. How do you deal with that? Still, no, you're Victor, coming from the no, but Viktor Orban, <laughs> I think we have too much Viktor Orbans in the member states of the European Union. We have, I, I don't know one member state without Viktor Orbans. Small Viktor Orbans, bigger one, prime ministers or us. In, short, in journalism, in, in, bis, in the business world and in politics. Yes, the authoritarianism, also the anonymity in the decision-making process, shows us daily what we have to do, what we have to change. But it is too easy to say there is Viktor Orban and he is the only one blockade for our future. We have to start an open debate and we have to show the people what is better for the citizens, for our common future. And we have a toolbox to safeguard the European demo democracy and this toolbox is working. But we have also in all member states especially also in Austria, a lack of trust. Mm -hmm. A lack of trust of the policy makers, a lack of trust of the public institutions, a lack of trust of independent medias, and so on. So we have a lot to do. It is too easy to speak about Viktor Orban. Thank you. <laughs> so as the last speaker for the opening, I would like to invite on stage a very distinguished member of the academia who knows very well what it's like to deal with authoritarian regimes or democratic authoritarian regimes because her institution had to change countries from Hungary to Austria. Please welcome the president and rector of the Central European University, Shalini Randeria. Please. <laughs> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to speak to you. And I often don't know which hat I should be wearing. Am I speaking to you as the president of a university which was forced, probably the only one within the European Union, to leave a country and to move to Austria where it has found in Vienna a new home? I sometimes am asked to speak as an Indian. I was born in the US, I grew up in India, but I've lived double the number of years in Europe than I have lived in India. So I don't know which hat I should be wearing. I pay taxes in three European countries, and I have voting rights in none. Uh, that, that tells you... So that tells you something about a problem in European democracy, which I think we really need to address which is the disenfranchisement of millions who are living in Europe, residents, working here, taxpayers, but have no political rights at all. So I think that's a flaw which we need to uh, address. Let me make three quick points, um, and uh, then I look forward uh, to uh, the discussion here. I would like to extend a warm word of thanks here publicly to you, um, uh, Vice President Karas, because you supported us, the CEU, very strongly in our fight against Hungarian uh, soft authoritarianism, as I call it. So let me start by making one point. I'm not going to make myself popular with this, but I think it's important that you realize that I think Europe's self-image is not shared by others in the world. And this is one of the reasons that, this is one of the reasons why there is a totally different perception of the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine in Europe, US, but in the Global South, which is not a homogenous category, but across Asia, Africa, Latin America, there is little support for this as a story of democracy versus autocracy. 
Two reasons are important. One, I think, is a reason which uh, Vice President Karras, you are absolutely right to point to, and which is, it's not a cold, war, a cold War rhetoric where we can say there are democracies pitted against authoritarian states. In every country in the world, we have a polarized citizenry. The fight against open, or the fight for open societies, the fight against open societies is one which is in every country of the world. And we are seeing it at the moment in the United States at one of its major peaks, whether the Republicans will become a one-party democracy, putting in place through voter suppression and through all kinds of legislative acts, their permanent securing their permanent power in the US. So even consolidated democracies like the United States are not, this is not foreign to them, the fight for democracy is a struggle that we really need to take seriously in every society. So let me remind you of two book titles, 2019, which I think we can ignore at our peril. Larry Diamond wrote a very interesting book called Ill Winds, Saving Democracy from Russian Rape, Chinese Authoritarianism, and American Complacency. And the second book was Astra Taylor's book, which said, democracy may not exist, but we'll miss it when it's gone. And I think here lies a paradox which we really need to think about, because what we are facing today are not autocracies of the old style. We are facing what I call soft authoritarian regimes. These are regimes which are using electoral majorities and the rule of law to systematically, slowly, corrode liberal democracy institutions from the inside. And this means, unless we are very, very careful at monitoring this slide into soft authoritarian rule, and it may stay as soft authoritarian, soft because it's the use of law to undermine the rule of law. And it may stay as such, unless we really take this seriously, I think we are going to find more and more countries crossing the red line when it's just too late to be able to stop this democratic backsliding. The point that I want to make here is that democracy is at risk. It certainly is very much and obviously at risk um, in uh, countries which are on the front line, like in Ukraine and Moldova. And I wouldn't like to personalize Putin. I think the Soviet, the, the Russian establishment is equally responsible for this war. It's not just one man's war. I, I really think we need, to take, we need to take that establishment seriously because regime change, meaning one person out of power, is not going to change the fate of the countries that are suffering from, uh, and Ukraine is suffering from Russia bombing it because it wants to try to stop it from democratization. But much more insidious, in my view, is the soft authoritarian trend, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Let me make one point on why I said I think Europe needs to rethink its own image. In a lot of the part of the world, Europe is not a good benevolent power, because do not forget, we have a history with Europe. And that history is a history of colonial, imperial plunder, and of suppression of all rights, political, social, and human. So therefore, when people are looking at Europe, they are looking at it with very different eyes. So, uh, you know, we would say, in front of the church here, in fact, when I was walking past it, I saw there is an installation which says, skeptic or believer. And I thought to myself, in Tyrol, I may not probably say loudly that I'm a skeptic on immaculate conception, but I may probably say loudly that I am skeptical about immaculate perception because we do perceive the world from where we look at it. And if you look at it from Africa, you look at it from India, you look at it from uh, Southeast Asia, America does not look that benevolent, but Europe doesn't look benevolent at all. So there is a historical baggage here. But even the current situation is not benevolent because in these parts of the world, 
European environmental standards are perceived as hidden protectionism, and don't forget agricultural subsidies in Europe, the EU subsidizes, farm subsidies are 60 to 65 billion dollars a year. No farmer in Asia, Africa, Latin America can compete with these subsidies at all. So you want liberal open markets elsewhere, and Europe protects its own markets, as does the US. So these kinds of double standards don't make for much sympathy, and I think we really have to understand that. On top of that, I want to make one point, and it's an anecdote, but it's an anecdote which will show you something of the whole role of disinformation which President Sandhu pointed out to, and it's an anecdote on the, one of the most important pieces of disinformation on Indian social media about the Ukrainian war. Friends in India kept sending me this story last year, and I kept thinking, where does this story come from? It, doing the rounds all over India, it said, it's a totally patriarchal view of the world, but look at the story. It says, Ukraine was the unfaithful wife of Russia. It flirted with many lovers, the NATO and the EU, who seduced her but will never marry her. So of course the wronged husband, Russia, is right to be enraged, and he seeks to protect only his children, Donbas, and therefore it's very only correct and just that his errant wife be punished for this treachery. I trace the story back, and it comes from Chinese media. This is Chinese disinformation targeting Indian public opinion for months and months. And so we have a global problem with disinformation and its circulation, and I think we can only ignore it at our own peril. Two more quick points, and I'm done. One on climate change, what worries me here is that fossil fuels interact differently with structures of power and domination. So coal was more diffused than was oil. We can look at the materiality of coal and oil, but they play, a diff they play out differently. Geopolitically, I think the dynamics of renewables are very, very different because they can be decentralized and they don't have to cross the oceans. We don't need huge maritime security in order to guarantee our oil supplies. So it's a totally different geopolitical dynamics if we really decide to go in for renewables in a huge way, which we must. But these renewables are public goods. They must be treated as global commons. It's the sun, the water, the air, which we may not pollute, which we must learn to share, and it has to be an economy of solidarity, which will allow us to share the benefits of these together. And I think this is not very clear what we are seeing as global commons, because do not forget nationalism we have seen in the latest COVID crisis, vaccine nationalism. Africa is still reeling from Europe and the US not sharing vaccines. Even vaccines which were thrown away here because they went out of date were not sent to these countries. And the pharmaceutical industry, which really put very little money into the development of the vaccines because this was public money, decided to reap all the profits. So I think we have a real problem here about global solidarity when it comes to even a totally global pandemic. Last point, and I think we have two dilemmas to think about. Militarization leaves behind a very large carbon footprint. The Pentagon is the worst polluter in the whole world, probably. So as Europe militarizes, it really has to weigh the balance between militarization on the one hand and its green transformative agenda on the other. It's a hard choice but it's a choice we must talk about and face. We should not put it under the table. Last point, I think, as we decide in Europe, and I say we as somebody who sees herself as also belonging to Europe, 
as we must defend ourselves. And Andreas Streichel was very right to point this out. Europe needs a foreign policy, it needs a defense policy. It needs a strong policy towards the Indo-Pacific region, which is home to three out of five people in the world. Um, and it doesn't have one at the moment. I mean, the policy is there, but it's a rather vague one. Uh, I think as we uh, go towards this, I think the most important question we must ask ourselves is, what budgets are we going to divert towards this military and defense expenditure? The cake isn't going to grow. Economic growth is a problem because of limited natural resources on which it rests, however much our technological progress. And therefore, we really have to ask ourselves if Gandhi, in effect, was right when he said, the world has enough for our needs, it just doesn't have enough for our greed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the excellent points. You took the triple time, but you have three hats, so that's okay. And, <laughs> and it was time well spent. You answered all the questions I had for you, actually. That was, uh, thank you, and thanks a lot. It leaves us with nearly no time for the discussion between you, so I'll take a question from the audience right away. Um, is it the same question that you had for the Chancellor before? No, no, no. Do you have one for everyone? Okay, please. <laughs> Because this man has been raising his hand for the whole session, so please, go on. Yeah, I'm Benjamin, I come from Finland, and yeah, I have a question. We have been talking a lot about the climate crisis, and I see that it's really connected to the Ukrainian war also. And back in 2006, the United Nations stated, the livestock sector is, emerges as one of the top two or three most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems at every scale from local to global. The findings of this report suggest that it should be a major policy focus when dealing with problems of land degradation, climate change and air pollution, water, water shortage and water pollution and loss of biodiversity. And this was back in 2006. And yeah, you, you have to come to your question. Okay, the question is so, so okay, we are here in Albach. Why isn't the food yet vegan? or plant-based. Yeah, what are, the, what are the concrete steps that you are going to do to tackle climate change and animal agriculture? And I'm going to like, do an initiative that Albach goes plant-based next year, so I hope that we walk the talk also here. Thanks. Thank you. Point taken, I think. Um, I'll, I'll give a question to the two of you that has a lot of uh, votes in the app, and it's also my question. We're in kind of a perfect storm in Europe, and that's the last question for the session. We have an inflation, we have climate change, we have conflict, um, and we have a global perspective, and thank you so much for bringing that into this panel. That is not really on the side of Europe on everything, on the contrary. Um, so how could you, in this situation still go on with the big plans that you mentioned, Mr. Karas, and how could that work? Then I'll ask you second. Because when the first country, big European country falls, and there's, uh, how you said, there's Victor Orbans everywhere, that's not going to make it easier. Yeah, I think that is the big question in all villages and on all places of Europe and not only from Europe. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I will say the sanctions are not the only one reason for this. That is very important. So you say I, keep up the sanctions? Yes. Mm -hmm. The second point is the war against Ukraine is a part of the reasons, but not the only one. The real point, the, the, the real point is, I, I mentioned it, the complexity of all that. <laughs> Before the war of Russia against Ukraine, we decided the Green Deal, the Fit for 55 program, the climate neutrality, 
and the, the, the renewable energy plan for Europe. Now we know renewable energy and the energy policy is not only connected with the climate change, it is also connected with security policy, economic policy, and uh, with, our, with inflation and with all others. That we have to realize and we have to give common answers. There is no individual answer. We all, that is an, also here, the European Union as a community must give a common answer with, inter, in, with different ways. We must be more independent. We must be more competitive. And we must be more future-oriented as price-oriented. And here our values, the democracy and others, are playing a very important role. We have to finally understand that we cannot take our fundamental principles for granted. We have to fight to value them, to fight for them, and to defend them. And we have many different inst instruments, but these instruments are connected. There is no single one answer. And we know it, and we are, happy, we are discussing it, but it is not a question of black and white. That's it's good that we have two weeks here in Alpbach to discuss it, <laughs> because it's really complex. <laughs> Thank you, Otmar Karas. I'll hand it over to you. That's a big project, and that's a big vision for the future. We're very crisis-centered right now and not very centered in the vision that Ant Mankaras um, uh, was talking about. He even said, yes, we can. Um, can we? Do you I see so. that? I hope so, because we don't have an alternative. Uh -huh. We have no alternative to liberal democracy with its plurality, with its tolerance, with its tolerance of criticism and dissent. We have no alternative to a very important European achievement, and that is the welfare state. This is the welfare state that under neoliberal austerity politics we have been chipping away at slowly. And I think this is probably among the pillars of European prosperity after uh, the Second World War. So only at our own peril could we really uh, chip away at the welfare state. I think it's the, one of the major pillars of liberal democracy in Europe. It's not always uh, the uh, pillar for democracy. Uh, India doesn't have a good uh, welfare state, but uh, India has no problem uh, with people being dissatisfied with democracy. More people go to vote in Indian elections than anywhere in Europe. So the poor have saved Indian democracy time and again by always going uh, to vote, unlike the middle class and the rich. So this is a European problem, not a worldwide problem, the coupling of the welfare state with liberal democracy. So I think we need to protect the two together. The third point, and since I've spoken too long, I'll just make one more quick point. And that is to say, I think, uh, if you look at one of the other problems with the way European democracies have been framed, European nation states have been framed always in ethno-national terms. And that's one of the reasons why you are getting such a lot of resonance of the so-called great replacement theory, that the majority is going to die out in Europe, that they're in very many countries, there's a huge demographic crisis. I think, and it has a huge impact, the way that discourse uh, is being propagated at the moment by many of these soft authoritarian leaders all over Europe. It has a huge impact on women's rights, on reproductive freedom. Uh, Poland is a good case, uh, uh, but uh, the US is uh, obviously peddling these ideas and making sure that right-wing groups in Europe also take them up. So I think we really need to rethink if we want to stick to this 19th century idea that a territory can only be inhabited by people of one language, one culture, however that culture may be defined in Germany as the light culture, so we have to think about what it may be, and of one religion. I think we need to rethink the basis of uh, nation states as plural and diverse. And I think that's where India could teach us. That is such an important point. Thank you so much on that. Thank you very much. And thanks to the 
two of you and for the perspective you're giving us for the forum. These are points that we will discuss in the next two weeks. Thank you for being here. Special thanks to the people standing for two hours. We stayed within the time, but it was a long time, so thanks for being here. But now there are drinks. Um, uh, cheers to if 22 is taking place right outside. So uh, the get-together is starting now, start the discussions. It's powered by R1. So please, let's meet there, and I wish you a great Forum Altbach 2022. Thank you. <laughs>